Welcome to the National Performance Network's 2023 conference. Uh, we are so excited to have you here. I am Caitlin Strokosh, the president and CEO of NPN. And joining me to welcome us today is my wonderful colleague, Stanlin. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be with y'all today. My name is Stanlin Brevet. I use the pronouns she, her, hers and I'm the director of national programs at, the, at NPN. I'm calling today from NPN's office, which is headquartered in Balbancha, the Choctaw name for New Orleans, which translates to the land of many tongues. New Orleans is on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Choctaw, Chirimacha, Caddo, Homa, Ishak, Natchez and Tunuka peoples, as well as the Petite Nations. Here we also recognize the Alabama, Biloxi, Cushata, and Ofo peoples, and others who were forced into Louisiana from their ancestral lands. We aim to honor these communities, past, present, and future. So what does that mean for NPN, to honor Native and Indigenous communities? For us, this means a commitment to building Indigenous engagement through every phase of our convenings, whether in person or virtual. And when we enter any community, we seek to engage and learn from people native to that place in a spirit of humility, curiosity, and respect. It means a commitment to supporting Indigenous artists through all our grant making programs and to continue to evolve what that support looks like as determined by the artists themselves. And it looks like a commitment to learning throughout our network about indigenous principles, decolonization practices, and engagement with indigenous communities. Like today's keynote, our intention is for these to be iterative conversations that build throughout the year and deepen our learning and practice together. For example, last year's virtual conference opened with a keynote session, How We Gather Indigenous Organizing Principles, with Christopher K. Morgan, Ashley Minor, and Dakota Camacho. Our last in-person conference in New Orleans in 2019 began with Native artists Monique Verdan, Haley Dardar, Jeffrey Darnsberg, and Tammy Greer sharing the indigenous histories of Southeast Louisiana. One of the ways we've deepened our learning around support for indigenous communities through the last year is through our participation in the First Nations Performing Arts Decolonization Cohort, which you'll hear more about in today's keynote, Decolonizing the Field, led by long-term, long-time NPN-supported artist, Emily Johnson. But before we jump into the keynote, Let's first meet the NPN staff. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Hi there. So good to see you. I'm Sage Crump. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm director of the Racial Justice and Movement Building Department here at NPN. Let's have a great conference. Hi, I'm Riley Yaxley. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm NPN's resource development manager. I hope you all enjoy the 2023 annual conference. My name is Didi Dubois. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the community liaison at NPN. Hola a todos. My name is Diana Lanza Escalero and I'm the convenience assistant. I use she, her pronouns and I'm sitting out here in the front porch in a swing chair and I'm wearing a purple shirt, colorful earrings. I have very dark hair and dark eyes and my face is covered in freckles. Um, let's have some great virtual time together. Hey y'all, I'm Sarah Carminati. I'm NPN's communications manager. I use she or they, they or she pronouns. And as a visual description, I'm a light-skinned person of color with dark curly hair. 
this year I have the pleasure of calling into the conference as a guest on Tecoha Nibia Guarani lands, colonially known as Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hi, my name is Brittany Dudley. I am the data and information associate here at NPN. Um, my pronouns are she and they. Welcome to the conference. Hello, my name is Brian Graham. My pronouns are he, him. I'm NPN communications consultant and graphic designer located here in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm very happy to be here. Looking forward to experiencing this great conference with you all. Have a good day. Hi, my name is Nick Huster. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm the National Programs Associate here at National Performance Network. It's, it's nice, nice that he needs you. Hi, everybody. I am Cindy Landor, the Fiscal Sponsorship Assistant for Southern Programs. I am so excited for our conference this year and so excited to see all of you. Oh, hi. My name is Alan Playa. I just used to be in front of the and I'm one of the program specialists at NPF. Welcome to the conference. Thank you, Alec. Hey, y'all. I'm Steve Bailey, he, him, and I'm the director of operations. Hey, Steve. Hi, my name is Stephanie Atkins. I'm the director of Southern Programs. Pronouns she, her. And I hope you enjoy the conference. I hope they do too, Stephen. Hey, you again. Hi, I'm Caitlin Sturbash, she, her. I'm the president and CEO of the National Performance Network. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> Clickety click. Oh, hi there. I'm Stanley Brevet. I'm the director of National Programs and I use the pronoun she, her, hers. Have a great conference. Hey, I'm Orchid Robinson, she, her. I'm the convenings program manager and I'm just excited to share the next week with y'all. <laughs> Wait, who? What? You? Wait, who? <laughs> hey y'all, I'm Adam Garrett, he, him. I'm the operations manager here at MPN. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. Um, as you just saw in the video, I'm Orchid. Um, I'd like to take a moment to just mention a few things you can expect over the next few days. First, we'll begin each day with a keynote, each of the four days. Um, hosting virtually again this year and not having those time and place barriers allowed us to gather some pretty incredible panels that I'm really excited for y'all to see. Um, we've also organized over 20 breakout sessions for y'all this year. These will give you a chance to participate, learn, and share in smaller groups. You will have registered for specific breakouts when you registered for the conference. Most of our breakout sessions don't have capacity restrictions, so you can still add them to your personalized schedule, which can be accessed in the My Event tab but there are a handful which were first come first serve. So they may or may not have filled up already. We'll also have artist showcases presented on the second and fourth day of the conference. And the showcase is a highlight every year and this year will be no different. Um, we encourage everyone to come and engage in the chat box during the showcase. Some of the artists presenting work will also be in the chat and I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. This year we'll have multiple ways for attendees to engage with each other through the conference platform. The first way is to simply join the chat during any session. Every session will include a live chat box where you can give a shout out, speak to one another, ask questions, or just send each other some love. And there's always at least one member of NPN staff moderating each session, as well as session organizers and presenters or artists who are presenting work. So the chat is a pretty simple way to engage and communicate with people. This platform also allows us to take chatting a step further with one-on-one -on -one video conversations that you can schedule with one another throughout the conference. 
under the attendee tab, you can use the smart filters to search for specific speakers and attendees, request connections, and then socialize with other attendees directly. Under the event forums tab, you can continue the conversation after a plenary session or an artist showcase has ended. These public boards are where you can propose an overarching question or an insight that bubbled up from a session that you're, you've attended. Okay, lastly, uh, we always hope that you'll share your conference experience on your own social media platforms using the hashtags NPN2023 and NPN Virtual. And that's it for me. Um, again, I'm just so grateful that y'all are here with us and uh, I'll pass it to Caitlin for a little more housekeeping before we dive into our first keynote. Thank you, Orchid. And um, Orchid, I'm, I'm so grateful for all the ways that you have focused on our well-being through our convenings these last few years in particular, um, as we have pivoted between in-person and virtual and all of the uncertainties of this time. Um, your centering of our wellness um, really has, has been a highlight of this work together. Um, I want to just share a couple of the other ways that we are thinking about centering well-being in this space. Um, we recognize that in inviting challenging conversations, we also need to create a healthy environment to do so. Um, so we've taken some steps to make this a place that centers our wellness. And we also ask that all of you commit to making this a space of wellness together, one that is rooted in justice that is free of racism, transphobia, homophobia, ableism, misogyny, classism, or other oppressions. And we hope that all attendees will act as a community of accountability together and call each other in to this work. We also wanna know when something happens that goes against our values. And NPN takes seriously any reports of racism, transphobia, homophobia, ableism, misogyny, classism, or other oppression that may happen in this space. If an incident does arise during the conference, please know that we have a rapid response team, which is a team of colleagues who have generously volunteered their time to address issues that may arise. And attendees are encouraged to alert the rapid response team by emailing me at caitlin at npnweb.org. All of this information is also on the conference website and um, are things that you have received in your, your uh, daily update emails as well. So we'll keep that coming to you in those forms, um, but please know that we are here to hear from you about how this experience is. I wanna note a couple of um, access accommodations as well that will be here throughout the conference. NPN is committed to ho hosting accessible and inclusive events. And each year we learn more about how we can expand this access. Uh, this year, all keynotes will include ASL and real-time captioning in English. All the breakout sessions will have ASL and either closed captions or CART. And if you have any trouble with the event platform or accessibility services, you can click on the help desk tab for live support during the conference or email virtual at conferencedirect.com. And that's in your daily email updates as well. Last thing I just want to say is that um, we understand and acknowledge at NPN that we are all entering this space with our own mix of curiosity energy, exhaustion, rage and joy, grief and wonder. And we have built in longer breaks this year for more spaciousness. We've spread the programming out across more time toward making this a space of care. And we hope you'll also take care of yourselves. Be on or off camera as it suits you. Know that your children, your pets, your snacks, your fuzzy slippers, <laughs> your dance breaks are all welcome. And however you are showing up today, we are so glad you're here. So grateful to share this space with you. We hope you'll find what you need over these next few days together. With that, I will cue up our opening keynote, Decolonizing Our Field. Thanks, y'all.
Hello everyone. To my, it's really good to be here with this incredible group of people, um, friends and colleagues and uh, accomplices uh, here to talk um, in this session with First Nations Performing Arts um, and our accomplices about decolonization processes, action and assessments. I'm Emily Johnson. I'm from the Yupik Nation. I live in Lenape Hoking. I'm a choreographer, dance maker, and co-lead of First Nations Performing Arts, and um, just really happy to be here with you all. I'll pass it over to Ronnie. Yeah, Osio everyone. Um, my name is Ronnie Pinoy, she, hers. I'm Laguna Pueblo in Cherokee, uh, and uh, I reside on the land stewarded by the Wampanoag Nation, also known as uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I have the pleasure of working uh, with Emilita Stewart, First Nations Performing Arts, um, and I also uh, act as a Director of Artistic Programming for Arts Emerson. Um, and I am, uh, just to say on behalf of FINIPA, uh, which I'll just say is our uh, kind of sweet shorthand <laughs> for First Nations Performing Arts, um, thrilled that we have this amazing group gathered um, of folks that are in uh, regular, um, collaboration with FINIPA and accomplices with us um, in sharing uh, really a broader, broad picture um, of the work uh, that's happening in this space around uh, decolonization and um, building strong and robust indigenous features. So um, we're gonna be having a number of sections that we're gonna be spending on today. So you'll hear a little bit about uh, FINIPA's decolonization and network track. We're gonna hear about a land acknowledgement assessment uh, you're going to hear about a decolonization assessment survey. There's going to be um, kind of really beautiful little chapters over the course of our next roughly um, hour and a half together. And so with that, I think uh, we will waste no further time and uh, hop right into some introductions. So I know Emily and I already had the pleasure of going. So maybe what I'll do is uh, pass it over to you, Kevin, uh, to give an introduction. And then from there, uh, pass it on to someone else. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Um, Yant A. My name is Kevin Holden, and I am the administrative steward for Emily Johnson and Catalyst. Um, I'm joining uh, this session today from the territories of the Cayus, the Umatilla, the Walla Walla, the Cowlitz, the Clackamas, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. Um, these territories today um, exist in what is referred to as Portland, Oregon, and I'm going to hand this off to Bill. Thank you, Kevin. Hello, everybody. My name is Bill Rausch. Uh, I uh, am on uh, the southern end of the island of Manahata in Lenape Hoking. I am the artistic director of the Ronald O. Perelman Performing Arts Center that is under construction uh, at the World Trade Center. I'm a theater director by practice. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and uh, I'm honored to be here today. And I am going to pass it to Adele. Thank you, Bill. Um, my name is Adele Person. Nasi in Argentina, but I was raised in Houston, Texas. My mother is Dutch, um, but was raised in Canada, and my father is French, but was raised in Argentina. And I share that really to recognize that history of European colonization in my family's history. I'm a 45-year-old white woman. I generally use she pronouns, but I'm open to others. Um, I have long, wavy brown hair pulled in a bun to the side like a ballet teacher. It's uh, brown, but actually really heavily silvered and probably more salt than pepper. Um, I have a heart-shaped face with a high forehead and thin eyebrows and a number of crow's feet and laugh lines. I'm wearing a brown cashmere sweater and really long dangling turquoise earrings made by an Inupiaq artist um, from Nome, whose name I'm not quite sure of. Outside the window behind me, you see patchy snow and the backside of the Homer Public Library on a foggy day uh, in January in Alaska. These are Denain and Sukpiaq lands named Tuget that we learned actually from Emily Johnson many years ago. It's also a small town called Homer, Alaska, and I serve as the executive director at Bunnell Street Arts Center and very honored to be here with you all. I'll pass it over to my colleague, Asia Freeman. Hola a todos. Me llamo Asia Freeman. I am um, actually 
born in Mexico to um, settler parents who came from sort of Portuguese uh, fishing and colonial tradition and a Jewish mama who was raised in New York and had the urge to travel and explore North. And one day they went to Mexico where I was born. I'm so happy to be here now for a few months on the land of the Chichimeca people. I'm the artistic director of Bunnell Street Art Center. And um, in that um, work, with that, which I co-lead with Adele Person, um, we have learned so much in this Benepa track. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to share that work through other engagements with the Alaska Arts and Culture Foundation and on the board of National Performance Network. I'm going to pass it to Vanessa. Thank you so much, Asia. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Vanessa Smith. Um, I'm currently located in Lenape Hoking, uh, New York. I am finishing up my master's degree at NYU um, in museum studies and hoping to then study uh, law, uh, hopefully also at NYU or in New York um, to continue this, this trajectory of, of decolonial projects and, and abolition. Um, I work um, for Enrich, which is the Equity for Indigenous Research and Innovation Coordinating Hub, um, very closely with Felicia, who will introduce herself next, um, and Emily as well. Um, I am a Black ally. I have locks that are about shoulder length, um, and I'm wearing a bright red turtleneck, and I'm very happy to be here and sharing with everyone today. Um, so I'll pass it on to, oh, I use uh, she, her pronouns, and I'll pass it on to Felicia next. Thanks, Vanessa. Hi, everyone. I'm Felicia Garcia. I'm Samala Shumash, and I'm really happy to be coming to you today from my homelands and what is now known as San Inez, California. Um, I work very closely with Vanessa, as she mentioned, under the umbrella uh, organization of Enrich, but I work for the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Initiative Local Context as the Community Outreach Manager. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a light a uh, skinned indigenous woman with medium length brown hair, wearing glasses, brown eyes, and um, it is a overcast day in Southern California. So I'm happy to be cozy inside. Thank you. Thank you everyone, Kriana. Um, Annie and I are gonna take a little bit of time here to talk about what First Nations Performing Arts is, and then one of our um, kind of main projects through um, and, and intention of, of that specific project called the Decolonization Track. So First Nations Performing Arts um, is focused on cultural change and on commissioning and touring and presenting indigenous performance. It's also focused on capacity building for the indigenous and non-indigenous performing arts sectors. Um, we are indigenous led um, and we make visible, public and transparent the urgent decolonization work that the performing arts field in what is currently called the US must do. We are committed to visioning and we are committed to action uh, with and for indigenous performing artists in service to um, aligning and making visible the entire gorgeous indigenous field of performance practice in what is called the United States, um, including uh, working with indigenous artists and indigenous art workers, organizations, and collectives. Um, we are committed to prioritizing the work of institutional decolonization in the contemporary performing arts field and beyond, and committed to readying the US-based indigenous performing arts sector to be a true global partner with our allies in kin and other geographies of the world, um, and readying the US-based um, indigenous performing arts sector um, to be a global partner in areas of the world as is such currently in the US where there is no current infrastructure for development, convening, researching, commissioning, and international touring in support of indigenous artists, nor a government or public acknowledgement of settler violence and reparations work. Um, and we are um, uniquely focusing on building local and international touring, commissioning, and residency support for indigenous artists in a way that is um, not fully addressed by our partners and collaborators um, 
in what is called the United States. And so First Nations Performing Arts really comes at a place of empowering and centering Indigenous artists. And we work, as you'll hear in a little bit, via the network track, which is um, we our work is guided by Indigenous artists who are in the network track. And uh, these folks really guide um, what our work is and what our focus is. Um, and we are working to uh, decolonize the performing arts field as well, which Ronnie will talk a little bit about here um, right now. Yeah, um, and I'll just add briefly a quick visual description since I neglected to um, offer that earlier. Um, and this is Ronnie Pinoy speaking. Um, so I'm a light skinned uh, woman in her late 30s, long brown and rolly hair. I got some um, Pueblo uh, jewelry on uh, channeling my ancestors this evening and uh, some wood paneling in the background, purple shirt, purple booth behind me. Um, and yes, uh, um, thanks Emily for the wonderful <laughs> and succinct overview of what the uh, First Nations Performing Arts does. Um, and clearly with um, the ambitious uh, work that our hearts are in and, and undertaking this, um, we're very much uh, holding to the belief that to change everything, we need everyone. So we can't do all of this alone. Um, and the um, FINIPA cons uh, working consortium um, is made up of um, Emily and myself, uh, other indigenous leadership and accomplices as well. Um, and so that group is really um, an anchor for a lot of the work that we do. Um, followed, uh, I would say, in the past few years um, by uh, what was really a priority uh, initiative that we embarked on, which was the launching of two tracks. One, the network track that Emily mentioned, that was Indigenous-led and we'll be speaking about later on, and the um, decolonization track. And then the decolonization track, or detail track for short, um, was a um, eight or nine month, I would say, um, a series of conversations that we held completely virtually that were facilitated by Emily and myself um, and a really uh, wonderful group of um, accomplices that are um, uh, either um, either themselves or in partnership with their institutions were really interested in um, embodying uh, this decal work. And so, you know, oftentimes in um, institutional conversations and, you know, I'll even, um, and I'll say this too from my institutional, with my institutional hat on, that uh, often we can't, we don't have the, um, we don't allow ourselves the bandwidth or the capacity to dig into these conversations beyond land acknowledgement um, and beyond um, giving thanks for stewards of the land. So if we're really looking to move forward um, on decal and not just do uh, lip service to it, you know, what does that really mean? Like, what do what is the kind of active muscular activity that we need to do day in and day out to do it? So um, uh, there was a, uh, um, a syllabus that was put together that Emily will speak a little bit about um, um, shortly. Um, but over, over those uh, eight or nine months, uh, there was, uh, with Emily and I, were a group of about, I would say like 10 to 15, actually more than that, maybe closer to 20, um, individuals from uh, accomplice organizations, and they were based geographically all over what is known uh, as the US, and uh, three of them we are so pleased to be on this call, um, Bill, Asia, and Adele, uh, to speak about their experience. Um, but we covered everything from, um, you know, what do we mean by land back? Uh, what do we mean about, you know, right relationship to land and to history and to people? Um, we uh, talked about um, language and ownership, cultural appropriation, uh, the, a wide array of uh, topics that over the course of our time together, we hope um, intersect and challenge uh, an entire worldview so that we were, um, I think what Emily and I were really hoping to do with these accomplices is move beyond a kind of a, okay, here's how to work with Indigenous Artists 101, to kind of a 201 um, you know, level conversation about um, there is no roadmap for this because if there was, we wouldn't need to do this work. You know, we are all creating a different kind of world together. So how can we, um, in a spirit of uh, collaboration, shared knowledge, digging into all of the areas where um, you know, there may be gaps in knowledge, there may be questions about, well, how would I even start a 
kinship budget to, you know, develop relationships and activities with uh, the, you know, indigenous folks in my community, you know, um, asking all of those big questions and really uh, challenging every step of the way this notion of um, needing to know exactly what to do. So we offered a lot of stories, we offered a lot of ideas, but ultimately there was a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of energy that I think Emily and I uh, put towards inviting um, the amazing folks on those calls to really think about um, what does leading decolonization from your institution today look like and what, you know, what action can you take now? Um, because there is no perfect day uh, to take on this work. It's gonna be, um, it's going to be messy. It's going to be, um, uh, and we're, we're going to have to all, you know, build it and make it up as we go along. Um, so with all of that said, uh, you know, Emily and I, over the course of those months together, um, it was a really joyful experience of facilitating back and forth, um, offering this material, uh, offering a lot of questions, having a lot of frank and vulnerable conversations about how difficult it was to sit in this work. And um, I also imagine how tough it could be hearing all of this information and figuring out how do I share this with, you know, with the colleagues at my institution, with other institutions, and to be uh, an accomplice in that way. Um, so it was uh, the experience of, I can't imagine that Emily or I um, individually could have done this work. It was something that was so powerful to have both of our experiences and also different ways of um, speaking about these things with this group, and um, it, it was a very courageous group in being the first group to kind of take on this this work with us. Um, so, with that said, what I'll um, before I pass it over to Emily to talk about the, um, the syllabus, um, I thought that I would also underscore uh, the importance of what our uh, network track had to say about the decal work that we were doing. So, you know, um, I think it can be easy when um, we think about, okay, First Nations performing arts, that we're kind of thinking about how to support indigenous artists get, get gigs, right? Well, you know, um, yes and no. We've been, um, in carrying this work forward, really wanting to listen to um, indigenous folks who are doing this work uh, via the network track, like constantly adding for the guidance of here are the resources we have, Here's the, um, the, the spirit that we we're entering this work into, what should we be doing? And especially in this past year, uh, the, the thing that just keeps coming back time and time again is not more opportunities, but safety. That uh, indigenous artists need to feel safe where they're working and that means physically safe, emotionally and mentally safe. And the constancy of, um, having a uh, culture, having to validate themselves and their experiences, or just the, um, the, the loneliness of um, coming into a space that is in conflict with um, ways of being and knowledge is just huge. So the, the real ask to Finipa um, was yes, to continue this decal track uh, for um, a primary reason of creating more um, safe spaces where indigenous artists can be in relationship um, uh, across what is known as the US. So um, I just think it's worth saying as we talk about the decal track and the wonderful, uh, and I'm, I'm so excited to hear about the, the learnings that um, Asian Adele and Bill wanna share um, with the Fuller NPN community. Um, I think it's worth saying that the, the decal track that we're the decal work that we're talking about doing is not the check mark of, okay, we um, now know how to burn sage, great. Uh, we now know to do a land acknowledgement, great. It's, it's an entire sea change of um, a way of being with one another and a way of acknowledging um, right relationship to uh, people who have been and are and will be uh, in our spaces, among many other things that could be its own master's class that we don't have time for today. Um, so with that, Emily, I'll pass it to you to talk a little bit more about the syllabus. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I just think it's so important to underscore that, that as, you know, as Indigenous artists and people and communities and, um, and leaders and defenders are, um, are making our own spaces, creating our own opportunities and work, um, 
that alongside of that and interwoven with that is this uh, very vital work of uh, specifically decolonize, decolonizing institutions. Um, and and really so appreciated uh, doing this work with you, Ronnie, because you're right, like there's no way, I know there's no way I could have <laughs> come into that work, so, you know, solo. Like we need, there were times Ronnie and I needed to hold one another up. I'm getting a little emotional remembering, or I don't know, thinking about it a little bit here. Like this is work that I really love and I'm very passionate about. Um, and it's, and and it also is like, it you know, it's, it's core work. Um, and, and what I hope with the folks, with the allies and accomplices and settler folks who join into this work, that it it shakes your core also. Um, and I think that it, it should. Um, and I, I, I always love to say that as much learning that we have to do in these processes, there is equal or more amounts of unlearning that we have to do because of the colonial structures in which we are living this is our reality and this is what we've been taught and inundated with and so there is a lot of learning through these processes um and i and that too processes the uh, decolonization involves multiple overlapping processes and uh it's 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 it, it is ongoing it is ongoing um and so just to note some of the work um, that we did with the decolonization track um, ronnie mentioned some of it um, uh, land acknowledgement as action we're going to hear a little bit more about that here in a, in a moment from felicia and vanessa um, but land acknowledgement as action and 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 land back and what the um what the reality of land back is to indigenous people and communities and how settler run institutions um, in occupying um, territories and indigenous lands uh, need to be uh, cognizant of and responsive to local land back efforts. You need to know what's going on um, and how to support the land back efforts in your areas um, and beyond. We talked a lot about um, and went through coursework regarding settler colonial violence and the reality of the ongoing um, settler colonial project. Uh, we talked a lot about um, access and leadership and representation and appropriation. Um, we had a section on liberation and sovereignty um, and the ways that um, um, that uh, well in all of this work <laughs> that that the ways in which um, uh, as as um, uh, as as allies and as accomplices, you also need to learn how to um, how to listen, right, or how to um, follow lead, um, while also taking radical action within your own organization. I think there's possibly sometimes a push and pull there. How do you take uh, radical actions in your radical decolonial actions in your organization so that you are moving forward in terms of structural change and making deep shifts, um, and also at the same time, how do you gauge that with really listening and really understanding with what Indigenous folks are, are asking of in, in relation to all of this work um, in decolonization. So all of that relates to decolonization and systems change, time and radical care. Um, we talked um, uh, and had coursework regarding intellectual property and knowledge. Um, and did a lot of assessment um, both uh, individually and in small groups. And some of the kind of homework uh, um, that organizations um, that the folks joining the default track did were in relation to uh, their kinship budgets, which is something that Joseph Pierce um, talked about uh, in a conversation we had, I don't know, a few, a few years ago. Um, so kinship budgets, what is a kinship budget? How do we frame uh, our decolonization work in spaces where um, uh like budgets that so th so that we're so that we're reframing the very you know the core of our institutions sometimes we need to we absolutely need to resource this work in an ongoing and 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 way that might um might challenge uh a lot of the systems right right in our organization from the start so um kinship work kinship uh, that's like in our budget um and there's a whole syllabus with the readings and the coursework and artists and um it, it's been a joy to develop that um in relation yeah and if you don't mind emily i'll just say that um uh the decal track 
we'll be coming back for round two. Yeah. Um, so certainly if you're interested, um, please do uh, reach out to um, Emily or myself to about, um, as we as we take in the learnings of this amazing first uh, group and think about how to continue this work. Wonderful. With that, we're going to uh, pass this over to uh, Felicia and Vanessa. We're going to uh, share some in uh, information on what they've been working on regarding land acknowledgments um, and making land acknowledgments actionable and real. Thank you, Emily. Um, thanks, everyone, for inviting us to share today. Um, Lisa and I have been part of a working group alongside Emily um, and Jackson Paulus and Nikki Hunt and Jane Anderson, who are not here today, but we just want to recognize all their contributions to this project. Um, and what we've been working on for the past um, year or so is a land acknowledgement assessment survey. Um, I think all of us came together because we're really concerned with this um, you know, point that Emily was speaking about, which is land acknowledgement as action and how how can we create a resource that um, that um, inspires or compels institutions and organizations to um, to create effective land acknowledgements. Um, and so we kind of came together to try and understand what how we can identify the components of an effective land acknowledgement and we um, came up with this survey. Um, it's available here on this website, landacknowledgements.org. Um, it's a 35 question uh, survey just using um, Google. Um, but I think that Vanessa will talk a little bit more about the intention of the survey, but I just wanted to speak about the background. As I mentioned, we all kind of came to this work with our own experience with land acknowledgements. Um, and I had um, with Jane Anderson in 2018, which is available on this site. Um, and it was meant to be sort of a really straightforward FAQ on the practice to um, help. I found that this guide was really inspiring more questions than answers. Uh, I found that a lot of institutions' practices uh, involving land acknowledgement were um, really problematic, and um, so that's what led me to uh, join this working group and uh, try to find a solution. How do we stop institutions from perpetuating colonial patterns? Um, and so I will pass off to Vanessa to talk about what led her to this work. Thank you, Felicia. And hopefully my, my connection is okay. Um, please let me know if I freeze or turn into a robot. Um, I kind of joined into this work uh, also through Professor Anderson, um, a class that was taught in the fall of 2020, 2021, I believe, or 2020 actually, excuse me, um, a class called Critical Heritage, Memory and Temporality. Um, and so Professor Anderson working with um, with Emily Johnson kind of thought about and thought through an assignment to prompt this kind of 30 person class, um, thinking about uh, what kind of openings exist um, and what further change is possible uh, with land acknowledgements, uh, specifically that institutions have published and that are currently up on the internet. So what uh, the, the assignment itself was to compare and contrast uh, land acknowledgements after doing a, a few readings um, and think about um, how these land acknowledgements and to what extent do they increase indigenous rights in land and make uh, indigenous rights and land presence visible and recognizable and actionable and are these just performative rhetoric um, empty statements um, or is there a way to kind of activate them and really push for some sort of accountability. Um, so I entered the space then in 2020 um, and co collaboratively with from this class, uh, we had kind of a collective um, almost 60, 70, um, uh, 70 data points basically 
if you will, of, of different land acknowledgements, uh, what they look like, um, our assessments of them as, as, as scholars um, in this program, um, and how we thought that they could be changed, where their weaknesses were, what they were saying, and what they weren't saying. Um, and so with this data then, um, we put together um, a database which I'll show here on our website, which is kind of at the core of, of, of what this work is. We wanted to make visible um, <clears throat> what exists um, so that things could be compared and contrast and, and we could understand um, what is happening, what is not being said, um, and, and where, these, where these gaps and holes for opportunities really exist. Um, and so we created this survey based on um, based on all of these data points based on these land acknowledgements that we assessed together and and we thought more about um, what would it look like <clears throat> for these land acknowledgements to be more effective um, for them to provoke and promote uh, institutional accountability um, to put some action behind these statements um <clears throat> and so excuse me i'm losing my voice here um we put together this database um and then we kind of situated the database in a larger online resource um with this website so the database exists here as well as the survey uh, which i would love to encourage everyone in the audience to to go ahead and take as felicia said it's about a 35 uh, questions th survey it takes about 30 40 minutes to to complete um and the questions are very thorough, uh, and we thought that we'd actually uh, run through some of the questions right now um, to give an example of, of how we're trying to kind of very pointedly, and Emily, feel free um, at the end as well or whenever to jump in because you've been very involved in this process, um, to ask difficult questions, to have institutions reflect on the work that they're doing um, and, and think about multiple things at once. Um, um, and we want to also note that um, that this we're not necessarily trying to be prescriptive and saying this is what a land acknowledgement should be or should look like. Um, rather, posing these questions to say, are you thinking about this? Does your land acknowledgement address these issues? And is your land acknowledgement in whatever form, whether it's written, whether it's a practice, um, is it is is there action behind it? Is it moving towards building uh, meaningful and equitable relationships with communities? And I'll so, just add. Please, oh, sorry. I just please. wanted to add also that our survey sort of addresses the process. It's not just about the statement itself and the action that comes after. I think we are all really concerned with the process for how acknowledgments are developed. You know, what are the relationships with? the statements and um as oh is my internet okay that might have been Vanessa's internet um but I think that the survey really gets at some of those really important questions and 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 should lead institutions to reflect on their own internal processes and the way that they interact with indigenous people um which I think is exemplified through the example questions that we selected Yes, thank you. And, and I'll just go ahead right off of that note, actually, Felicia, and read some of the questions that we've selected. Um, again, talking about um, it, are there meaning, are you moving towards meaningful relationships? Are you crediting the correct uh, communities that are contributing? Um, one of these questions that we had is if there were Indigenous contributors, what was the process? How, how was uh, credit attributed? Uh, what was the compensation process? Um, and were contributors on staff or were they consulted? Um, these are important things to be thinking about. Um, another question on the survey is, is the land acknowledgement a static script? Um, is it just a statement that's read each time? Um, or is it recorded? Is it embodied? Um, we also ask, does the land acknowledgement recognize and respond to the current needs of present day indigenous communities and what they are communicating? Um, I think a, a big thrust or what we're trying to highlight as well is just the, the really important action of, of listening and doing research. A lot of times institutions um, quickly uh, sit down to write a statement without doing research or, or listening to what the communicated needs of communities actually are. Um, 
Felicia, do you want to read the next few questions or uh, kind of move on to our next points? Sure. Yeah, I don't mind reading these. Um, so just two more examples. Does the land acknowledgement name actionable steps towards decolonization? And does the land acknowledgement make a commitment to decolonial action, such as repatriation, access rights, etc.? I think all of us came to this working group having seen so many land acknowledgements that are kind of the end point for institutions. They don't name anything that's that's to come next, or they don't make any sort of commitment to anything further than a land acknowledgement. And um, so we're just kind of pointing to these issues within the survey. And um, so I think comparing different institutions' responses is a really great resource, but I think also taking the survey is a really great um, exercise and self-reflection for institutions as well. Um, and I'll just add to that quickly to say, um, just thinking largely in this in this conversation about uh, decolonial actions, um, how can institutions use land acknowledgments, uh, use this survey as a prompt uh, to further these actions? I think. Um, as Felicia was saying, it's it's very um, it's a it's a self reflective exercise, um, but also what we're trying to point to is that land acknowledgments can be um, can be the place where institutions verbalize what their action plans are. Um, and one question that we often get in this presentation is, well, what what is a good example, or what what, what does this potentially look like? And, and we've seen really powerful and effective land acknowledgments where institutions um, that hold collections, for example, um, articulate what their repatriation process will look like, or how they're um, how they're um, looking to decolonize these collections. And so um, I think that's what this survey is trying to point to is, is moving from rhetoric um, to action. I think I'll just end my portion at least by um, once again, uh, encouraging everyone to to visit our page um, and take the survey. Um, you're also able to download the questions as a PDF um, under the survey tab, <clears throat> which we would highly recommend to do. And, and feel free to use these questions, circulate them, build off of them. Um, we've also have a resource tab um, where we've included a lot of resources and try to um, Try to not rely on or, or push people to immediately ask for, for Native and Indigenous labor as their first step, uh, but go ahead and educate themselves. So we have a list of resources here that are available. Um, and definitely our landing page, we try to amplify other Indigenous-led actions around uh, land back and other decolonial movements. Oh, and then, sorry, the last plug that I have actually is um, we have a webinar coming up on um, January 27th uh, around this work um, to have a larger conversation, um, and we will make that link available as well to this audience. So, um, Yeah, I'll just add, thanks, Vanessa, um, that we're hoping to receive some feedback or comments from anyone who is interested uh, at this webinar that Vanessa just mentioned. Um, you know, much like the resource, we recognize that there have been generations of folks um, doing this work, advocating for land acknowledgements, and it's, it's rooted in Indigenous protocol. And so um, we are definitely open to feedback we want feedback i think this is a really great community-led project and so we look forward to hearing the feedback from anyone who would like to participate that's awesome that's thank amazing you so thank much. you both so much yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. thank you vanessa and felicia it's so great um Ronnie, I don't know if you had some. I, I have a, I, a thought came to my mind. Yeah, you um, go. I didn't want to introduce. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, just as you were both speaking about this assessment process, and the and folks in the decal track um, did a version of this assessment as we were working on it before we had, had made it public. Um, and 
I like, I, I, I would love to hear maybe your thoughts, Rami, Felicia, Vanessa, on assessment as process also. Um, because I, I think sometimes that, that we think of assessment as like a, an end grade or like a, did I do it right? And, and here's the proof to, or here's the, here's the thing I need to do to prove that I did it right. And if I didn't do it right, I failed, <laughs> you know, which is a very colonial, colonial way that many of us are, are um, taught to, ta taught how we taught to live and how we're taught what success is. And so I think about how these assessment processes are decolonial also and how they do take courage to, to take part in. Um, but that is that is the ask as well. I was curious if anyone has a thought or a question or, uh, about that. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's really important. And I can't remember who I learned this phrase from, but I really love it. And I try and um, think about it, you know, um, whenever I do, I'm invited to do public talks like this one, um, but it's uh, learning in public. And I think that is so important and it's very brave. And I think that it really exists in contrast to the idea of failing. Um, and I think that especially within indigenous communities, there's so much support for people who are willing to grow and learn um, from the community. And I think that that's, that's what we're trying to do with this assessment and with having data available, available on our site. site. Um, and I think, I think more and more museums in particular should be open to this process. Um, hopefully my internet isn't slowing down. I think I sound like a robot for a second. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I think that this isn't meant to be, um, you know, highlighting museums or institutional failures, but, you know, comparing and comp contrasting and offering feedback and um, a space for self-reflection so that individuals and institutions have the opportunity to learn and grow in a public space. Gorgeous. Maybe we'll invite um, Kevin into the space here to continue to speak about assessment. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Vanessa and Tricia. Thanks, Emily. And thank you, Vanessa and Felicia, for um, talking about the land acknowledgement assessment process. Um, I we'll spend some time talking about the decolonization assessment survey, which has some, I think some interesting parallels and overlaps with the land acknowledgement uh, assessment process too. So the decolonization assessment survey is um, both a survey and a process that was developed in collaboration uh, between Emily and Catalyst and the Kennedy Center um, Social Impact Programming's research and evaluation team. Um, the survey is structured around Emily's decolonization writer, which um, I assume some of y'all are familiar with Emily's decol writer. Um, if you've not, if you're not familiar with the decol writer or with a decol writer, um, I know Emily will talk about more about her decal writer um, very shortly. Um, but the survey, like the decolonization writer, um, asks performing arts institutions to critically reflect and evaluate one's organizational structure, programs, funding, and leadership um, to identify benchmarks, barriers, and opportunity, opportunities to overcome perceived barriers to decolonization. And so in the survey, um, some of the areas that um, participants are asked about to reflect upon include um, commitments to decolonization and right relations to um, indigenous artists and communities, um, land acknowledgement processes and recognizing land treaties in which um, organizations um, in which organizations occupy on um, disclosures of how uh, income is generated 
uh, relationships and contracts with police and extractive industries, um, media and archives of indigenous art and artists, um, land use fees, and many other realms of action and practice that organizations can embody and support decolonization. Um, the, the decolonization assessment survey is also a process where we engage with institutions to assess um, their decolonial work over time. Um, we don't just ask institutions to um, just take the survey once and just check it off of their to-do list, like, <clears throat> I've done my decal work for the day. Um, and we, I think in continuing with what people have already talked about, we don't expect institutions to come out the other side of the survey um, fully decolonized or like <clears throat> got everything correct or it's not it's not really um it's not a scorecard or like a grade report it's we we ask institutions to engage um in this evaluative process over time and we do want to engage with you year after year after year and we want participants to take this survey yearly so that we can continue identifying uh, what is successful, um, what holds organizations back from these commitments, and what, re what resources do we need to continue this work. Um, we just had our first round of the survey shared um, with participants in um, FNPA's very first decolonization track in the fall of 2022. And already within this first round, we are identifying uh, patterns and benchmarks that performing arts organizations are at in their uh, decol decolonial work. Um, many are just dipping their toes in for the very first time and just learning um, what decolonization really means. Um, and understanding decolonization as a very deeply embodied um, act, a practice that is enacted in the world. Um, and many, many are very open and curious about um, where to where to even begin, which I think is actually like a very beautiful place for many organizations and institutions to be at. Um, some have been engaging with these ideas for a while, perhaps years even, um, and have already taken steps towards supporting and empowering Indigenous communities and artists, which is great. Um, some are even committed to sharing percentages of their budgets to um, Indigenous communities, um, and that's phenomenal to actually engage in that very direct material support for Indigenous artists and communities. Um, Emily and I are in the process of reviewing the data from this first round of the survey, and we're working toward developing a report that we will share out with our colleagues, with other presenting organizations, um, participants in the first decal track. Um, really, um, we hope that this report will exemplify um, the processes and the practices that institutions are working toward and serve as a record of how uh, the performing arts field is decolonizing. Um, and some of the ways that we want to continue developing and advancing this decolonization assessment process um, include wanting to expand the serving to engage uh, different facets of the performing arts field, including um, independent artists and producers and curators, um, thinking about how to assess um, funders and funding and organizations that fund artists and projects. Um, and <clears throat> we want to revise and expand the survey to include uh, key findings from this first round of the survey and emphasize questions that we see are areas that need work in the performing arts field and also get more institutions involved in this process, whether it's um, having more institutions participate in the survey, take the survey, 
uh, participating in FNPA's decal track. Um, I think there are many ways that this um, process can continue to evolve um, as we as this decol as this decolonization process is like always continuing and always evolving. Um, we're really motivated by this process because decolonization really can't wait for us. Um, we really need to abandon the colonial mindset and the colonial project as a whole. Um, and we need to decolonize and we need to decolonize the performing arts field now and into the future. And we, we see this as a tool to actually help performing arts institutions and organizations um, better support indigenous artists and communities and to decolonize their institutions and the field as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and I really love um, uh, Felicia and Vanessa, I really loved um, hearing you talk about the land acknowledgement assessment um, as a, um, as um, talking about land acknowledgement as action, um, not just as, um, not just as like throwing a sticker on a wall and calling it good or like um, as just language or marketing, but it's actually like a very deeply um, embodied um, act of reflection and um, also as a way to orient oneself in in relationship to indigenous communities and indigenous folks um, where we are at, like where you are physically at currently. Um, <clears throat> and, and I really love this discussion around um, evaluative process, processes as, um, as decolonial work. Um, I feel like, I feel like a lot of these assess like a lot of these processes um i assume that a lot of them are associated with like very traditional academic research and having to follow very specific rules and protocols around how we gather data and how we use data and how we share that into the world and i love this um this sort of um deconstructing of <clears throat> of that mentality to actually make assessment and evaluation as like something we all can engage in as assessment as critical reflexivity and critical self um, evaluation and to um, hold each other accountable to the work that we want to be engaging in. Thank you so much, Kevin, Koyana. Thank you. Um, yeah, I really love working with you, Kevin, and thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, we're going to hear now a bit from uh, Bill and Adele and Asia, um, Accomplice Action. Um, what, what, have, what, have, what have you all been, uh, been up to? What are you working on? What was your experience in the decolonization track? Um, yeah, really happy to always be in this process with you and to be, to be hearing from you. Gosh, thanks so much, Emily. Um, I can speak for myself and, and Bill and Asia, you can chime in, but it was such an incredible learning process. I mean, just the the book list, you know, of, of reading Decolonization is Not a Metaphor by Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Wang, or reading um, even like a, I, I think I read some of the more, you know, more of the books, you'd assign chapter one, two, and then you just keep reading like an Indigenous People's History of the United States, which and then you go around the world being like, oh, oh my goodness, or um, a copy editor style, you know, like to capitalize I an indigenous and and all these kind of ideas of of process over product. Um, yeah, I think it was tremendous. And it's tremendous also to work in a group, too, because in a group, you're kind of a field, you know, some people are ahead and some people are behind. And then you have a role both as a student and as a teacher in learning. Um, and I found those two things really uh, meaningful and valuable. What do you all think, Bill, Asia? Well, I, I definitely um, I agree with what you're saying, Adele. And I think to, um, to just to touch back to Felicia's point about learning in public, 
it's a nice way of saying failing forward, which is also an expression that Dell would use sometimes as we, I think in 2018 began um, learning in public about land acknowledgement and inviting um, our indigenous advisors and our whole board and community members into this process of trying to write a land acknowledgement. And it didn't take long for us to stick right out there and say, this is a living document and it's going to be this porous, changing, um, evolving and reflective place where we essentially, without scripting and repeating ourselves, are constantly adjusting through the learnings that we're having. And it felt um, so opportune to join in Cinepad discussions, as Adele said, to be in moments uh, really a student and in moments sharing um, some experiences of success and failure and feeling um, like, hey, this is some of the hardest work we may ever do, but also be some of the most important work. Mm -hmm. I, I heartily agree with that last statement with everything you both said. And this takes me back, frankly, to being part of the decal track and uh, um, just learning from peers. That was such an important part of it. The the readings and the videos and, and everything that uh, you provided, Emily and Ronnie, were very, very impactful. And equally impactful was listening to my peers react to what they had read and what they had uh, watched and hearing about the specific uh, decolonizing actions that people had taken or were contemplating or were afraid to take and the the specific commitments it was it was very inspiring it was very challenging and that was part of the inspiration was the challenge uh and i really feel like it changed my life honestly it, it was it was uh so impactful just every single session uh there would always be time during every session when my heart would start to pound really really hard because the entire way I look at the world was being challenged in the most uh, beautiful and meaningful way. It's remarkable. That's really yeah. Yeah. And I and I, I guess when I, th when I think about specific, um, uh, for for me, very specifically, it was the ongoing impact of settler colonialism. It was how much I had bought into the myth that there's a set of unfortunate historic events that happened back then, and that that is what we're here to discuss. And um, the fact that the settler colonial project is ongoing, is active uh, as a force uh, on this land and in this world, that was, one of the most um, profound shifts of perspective mm -hmm. for me. I'd agree so heartily. It's like, I mean, being there in that community led by Emily and Ronnie, you know, you could just pull the veil back and you suddenly you see like, oh, there's that story um, in this movie that I just watched, or, oh, there's that story in my neighbor's, you know, telling of his history. Um, there's kind of, there's the use of the past tense. This land was called something, something, or um, yeah, kind of everywhere. It's, and then you just realize this, the scale of the work you have to do. It's very little, little tiny thousands, millions of little things, and then, and very big. And the part, um, you know, I, I, I like to make theater too. I, I like to be on stage in our local community theater. And, and when you're there to organize all of those little details, you have to sort of think fundamentally who and what are you in relationship to, to a sovereign nation, to indigenous peoples? Um, you know, what, what is your, what's your role there? That's not oblivious, ignorant, centering and um, continuing those harm. Yeah. And um, one of we in the midst of this track um, back in the place now called Homer, Alaska, um, the, the first name to get Adele mentioned was lifted up by Emily in um, in um, 
a series of performances to get means at the shore. And so when Emily brought shore to Homer, she lifted up that name and um, it became a question and something that we um, really reached into through Benel over time to lift up that name and to lift up stories and um, a more complex vision of the place that had never really been shared. It certainly wasn't taught when I went to school, you know, at Homer High School. And that process is um, truly fascinating because um, you know how when you learn a word, you start to hear it all the time. Well, so we um, started to ask about to get and 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 write and query and and uh, an artist who is an indigenous futurist in our community came forward um, to Benel Street Art Center with a proposal for um, a public art um, installation that would acknowledge this first name of this place. But I did say indigenous futurist. And so on one hand, we're talking about a story that is still alive. And then we're also talking about the idea that the um, possibility of how humans might inhabit this earth is still yet to be fully realized and celebrated. And this story in all of its complexity really can't sentimentalize or just refer back to a people that were or people that are, but also a people that will be. And how will we in that conversation with our community leaders, with our other you know, nonprofit collaborators with people working in the city council and in the, um, you know, public works department convey the idea that this um, acknowledgement is really living to it's not just going to speak back to the past and it can't just be limited to the present, but open to, you know, what, what the possibilities um, are for this place. And at one point Adele wrote, you know, like, I hope that maybe that site itself will be given back. Like where, that's just a, a small beginning, but we want to push forward like the question and the possibility. And really that means we have to hold this place that might be uncomfortable for a lot of people. And certainly at moments will be very uncomfortable for ourselves. We just gotta keep being gracious and you know, reaching out to indigenous leaders and visionaries to say, how can we do this work better? Aisha, I, lo I love that you talked about futurity and 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 future paths because when I think about um, action that we've taken since um, being part of the track, uh, we had a commitment already. Um, we entered this process with a commitment to Indigenous artists and to Indigenous art. We had two artistic advisors, for instance, who are uh, extraordinary indigenous artists, but that commitment intensified so much. And in terms of who we're commissioning, uh, how we're trying to be responsive to requests from organizations that center indigenous work, uh, how we're hiring indigenous curators, how we're thinking about, um, and then of course, programming, right? In our, what will be our inaugural season and then beyond that that's a given, but that all of that intensified when I think about the work that lies ahead and that I sometimes feel overwhelmed by, um, but feel very energized to, to keep um, learning and keep uh, participating and trying to help lead within my own organization as an accomplice uh with uh the indigenous leaders in uh, in this zoom and elsewhere um I, just one example where we're really um in it in the struggle is uh that there should be there must be we want there to be indigenous representation in every aspect of the organization and that means the staff that means the board that means the donor base that means of course the community organizations that we build what we call civic alliances with. Uh, and I'm a leader within the organization, but I'm not responsible for every hiring. And I'm certainly not responsible for the board development process. And how do, um, just in terms of future paths, how can I as an individual, how can I as a leader within my organization, prepare the organization for the work that lies ahead and how can i keep learning from 
uh, my indigenous colleagues and my mentors uh, to keep keep that work alive and not just you know despair about what we haven't yet done but instead to live in the joy of the ongoing work in the ongoing process that sounds like both goal and challenge and um yeah good work ahead you're here there's so much good work ahead and and i just feel so grateful for i mean for living in this place where where there's such a, a an incredibly strong indigenous presence here in alaska or you know ownership i mean i'm a uninvited guest and um i was reflecting i think i was given almost like a, a tourism brochure recently and it's you know listed out some of like these are values that are here and they're like be thankful respect self others in our environment um don't take more than you need uh, be of good spirit and you know and really thinking like fundamentally and philosophically or spiritually what we what we want from the future wouldn't those be like such different different ways of articulating our fundamental values together as whatever kind of organization or nation or state or city are rather than what we have which is such an extractive and like mine how much is mine instead of what is what is my role in giving and enriching and mm. um i think i mean the challenge is so profound but artists are some of the ones who will like lead those ideas and performing artists and i think in particular um because it's sort of like a such an embodied practice and i think there's great challenge and possibility ahead it's so much it's about so much more than reparations it's actually ultimately about the what i've learned um is the most beautiful vision of relationship it's kinship and it's non-hierarchical and it's reciprocal and um it's really humble and those are things that that's the indigenous futurism at its heart that i think you know the world needs more than anything so there it's just been a really powerful uh it's been a really really powerful track and it's come at a time when we really need it you know yeah yes the, the whole context right of of like reflecting on a propagandistic narrative it's astounding as you know we have been surviving the trump era you know and so it's just like it's it's so um doubled up and layered and thick that um we've we've really really leaned into this cohort um spiritually academically you know socially <laughs> all the ways yeah and moving forward you know how do we sort of think of ourselves with respect to sort of this sovereign space that indigenous leaders and indigenous artists and performing artists are creating are we good neighbors do we provide a border a protective space do we serve as as like a a translator or ambassador um or traveler back to this sort of colonial culture in order to soften it so that it's ready for those ideas you know what what really do we do to be in right relationship to um, indigenous communities around us indigenous artists ronnie emily what what are your hopes for our track or the next track out there i mean there's a reason that we call this little section a compass action because we do invite you to be accomplices and ronnie and i talked yesterday about kind of our that difference between ally and accomplice and really um, inviting accomplices into the front lines of this work um, in different spaces and at different times. Um, and so um, that process being ongoing too. Um, and and I, I, lo I loved hearing, like I heard the goals of Land Back. I heard the goals, Bill, of, of bringing indigenous leadership into all all structures and layers of the institution um so so these goals and further goals right like i i remember we started the decolonization track i think the first 
the first session that we had, I said something like, I hope that at the end of this, we all get to a place where we're imagining something we can't quite imagine yet. Um, and that, 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 that imagining forward and those goals forward um, are, are really important in this process as we're also doing the nitty gritty. Like Bill, when you were talking about some of the, the nitty gritty you were talking about, I know um, uh, Mayen, your colleague who was part of um, Decal Track, spent a lot of time talking about how do I change the invoicing process to make it easier to pay people, mm -hmm. you know? And this, is, this was a big part of our conversation about budgeting and resourcing people and at people in different ways and less institutional ways um, and that you know i think that is really important that nitty-gritty stuff is part of this as well absolutely yeah and i'll say too i think that that's um i mean and first tremendous gratitude for the um for stepping into this space of being accomplices because it's uh it's something that requires a um it requires a real deep courageousness, especially to um, feel forwardly, feel publicly, and uh, come. I mean, we're and come together with you know me and Emily and others to kind of imagine something that doesn't exist yet and that we don't have a roadmap for. It's a lot easier to do something that looks flashy and successful that you know the rest of the world will um, will see and uh, and understand. So uh, so with that, I think. Um, but I'll kind of underscore about a lot of what you're talking about, um, about action in the decal track is that, um, for those folks in the plenary listening, is that, you know, I think what you might be hearing in some of the spaces between what everyone is offering is the sense that um, while there are specific um, actions that can like immediately come to mind about um, what can be done, a representation, land back, I'm not saying they're easy, but they can come to mind. Um, we're also thinking about an entire societal systemic shift and it can feel really hard to know how do I within this institution and also I as a human being how do I start to get from here to there and it really requires a tremendous act of imagination and that's why we all need each other so much and need to help each other recharge so much because that imagination is, is a muscle um, and so uh, you know, whatever action we take now, I think, yeah, to Emily's point, and hopefully by the time we're done with that action, we can think of a next step that we couldn't have even have imagined before we did the first thing. So it really truly is going to be iterative to get to a place where we're living in a more regenerative and not uh, extractive um, society in a different kind of relationship with one another. Because we all know the world's changing, uh, but it's up to us whether it's going to change for better or for not. So thank you all so much. That was uh, just sitting here, you know, it's, it's been a very uh, foggy uh, call so far with a lot of the <laughs> hearing about the wonderful work we've been doing together. Um, and with that, Emily, do we think we should uh, move to our next section? Yeah, I can't wait to hear you and Kevin talk about the network check. <laughs> Fantastic, Kevin, you ready? <laughs> All right, let's do it. So uh, we're here to talk a little bit more um, about FINIPA, specifically FINIPA's network track. So uh, I know we gave a little bit of a preview uh, earlier on uh, in the call um, that the network track was initially created uh, so that in making any decision uh, about uh, FINIPA, how we were spending resources, how we were setting ourselves up, um, did we actually have the best overall goal and mission in mind? Um, that was, we knew from the very outset that we needed to be in uh, constant uh, contact and be under the advisement of um, uh, a broad array of indigenous, I would say indigenous arts workers um, of uh, different ages, different um, geographies, different Kind of areas of the of the field so to speak um, and some working um you know with uh, what i would say are more like mainstream organizations and some that aren't so uh that was a commitment early on and we uh started uh our first network i would say that our network tracks have been um both um uh started out as a group of people that made a commitment over many months to meeting together um, predominantly virtually um, to really reflect and refine the direction of FINIPA going forward. 
And then uh, that work culminated in a gathering in, uh, so I would say it was bookended on both sides by a convening. So convening in 2021 kind of kicked off, here's the invitation to be part of our network track. Some folks were able to join, some folks weren't, but were part of that initial um, kind of seeding conversation. And then after the eight or nine months of conversation um, at the uh, in-person gathering that we had in 2022, um, we were able to go a bit deeper and reflect on what um, the virtual network track had discussed and also uh, the network track and decal tracks were able, uh, a lot of folks were able to meet one another in person at that 22 convening. Um, and so both our 2021 and 2022 convenings, uh, in-person convenings uh, were in um, what is known now as uh, Portland, Oregon with our um, wonderful uh, fiscal sponsor and accomplice, uh, PICA, uh, or Portland Institute for Contemporary Art. So, um, so with this network track, what was so uh, exciting and moving about it uh, to me um, was that uh, it was the very organic and uh, kind of naturally self-organizing way in which the, this group of folks came together to kind of determine, okay, here are some three areas of focus. And within that, we really um, leaned into the complexity of the different viewpoints and lenses um, that individuals were bringing forward. Um, but we heard a number of things. So um, uh, three areas really came to the fore. Uh, one is around protocols. The second is around data and platforms. And the third was around food justice. So uh, I'll speak just a tiny bit about each of them. Uh, and then Kevin, I'll pass it to you to talk um, about your experience being part of the network track because um, we were very lucky to have Kevin uh, during, <laughs> during that experience. So um, what emerged uh, in the protocol space was really the sense of a need that, um, you know, indigenous uh, artists are often um, put in a place of being very isolated and working with an institution or an entity with a work, uh, with anything they're doing. And there isn't any kind of rigorous um, uh, place to begin. There isn't any kind of reference that an indigenous artist can come forward either when working with another indigenous artist or indigenous organization or working across difference with, um, I'm gonna say, a more mainstream, a you know, dominant kind of cultural organization. There just isn't anything there. Um, and there was a lot of inspiration from the writer um, that Catalyst Dance, um, Emily's company, has um, put together. But even more than a writer, there was this sense of, okay, you know, um, many indigenous artists have um, feel a deep sense of responsibility and accountability to their own tribal nations. So what is that kind of protocol for how do we work together um, how are we in right relationship with each other? And um, and that can incorporate any and all of the ways we work together. So uh, there was real hunger for creating a series um, of protocol documents and processes that can really provide a foundation so any individual artist or institution is not coming in cold, uh, but that there is a kind of a baseline for, oh, these are some of the things that you should be thinking about. And it can be a kind of starting point for conversation. Um, so the second area, data and platforms, that was probably the most robust and winding road <laughs> network track group um, asking questions about, okay, what data uh, do we need in order to make visible and uplift uh, the work that Indigenous artists are doing in uh, what we call the United States? Of course, the even the word, the question of data um, brings up a lot of, uh, frankly, a lot of violence, a lot of uncomfortable um, history and of course privacy concerns are very paramount in our moment right now so you know what are the what are the platforms by which indigenous artists can um, support each other and uh, their own communities artistic work you know what is the um, way that we can shine a light on the work that other indigenous artists are doing so you know what are that those systemic ways um, that if anyone is looking to get to know more about indigenous artists and arts workers on Turtle Island, there's a place that they can go and it's robust and it also feels like it's um, uh, created with immense care and intentionality um, and safety. So those were, um, and, and it also expanded to questions about festivals and what are the ways in which we gather that can shine attention um, and can we 
in, in addition to working inside and with other organizations, how can we create our own pathways for um, by and for um, uh, work by and for indigenous uh, artists? So that's a little bit about data and platforms. And then the third, food justice, you know, you might think like, huh, food justice and arts, hmm, not, not quite sure. But uh, so much of, um, I don't think it's probably a surprise uh, to many folks to say that so much of indigenous culture is connected to um, food and systems of sustenance and ways of being. And, uh, you know, food justice is food sovereignty, is, uh, is connection uh, to culture and is part of how we engage with um, not only each other, but in the artistic uh, work that we do. So, you know, there were, um, there was some real interest in thinking about any time um, uh, indigenous artists are gathering, and frankly, any time uh, a group is gathering in a place of land, what is the relationship to um, food sovereignty, of the, you know, the food of that tribal nation? What are the ways that we are rematriating? Um, and uh, all the, the link between food justice and um, performance in terms of the critical work that indigenous, uh, like inter interweaving threads in terms of indigenous culture um, and, uh, and sovereignty. So they really feel like they're in lockstep and a lot of really exciting conversations about that. Um, so before I keep blathering on, I would love to pass it to Kevin to talk about um, if you can talk a little bit about your experience of being uh, in the network track and um, what the process was like and during viewpoints and whatnot. Sure, yeah. I um, So I got involved in the network track um, at the invitation of and encouragement from um, Aaron Boberg Downton, who is the uh, artistic director and curator of performance at PICA, uh, where I used to work at. <clears throat> and um, last, in 2021, um, PICA brought Emily to present um, an early um, iteration of her project being Future Being. Um, and as part of that presentation, um, Emily and Ronnie and FNPA um, held their first uh, convening for the First Nations Performing Arts. Um, and specifically, it was for, um, the convening was for Indigenous artists um, to come together to actually start really critically thinking about and discussing um, what do Indigenous artists and, and, and Indigenous performing artists need um, to to survive and to thrive <clears throat> and to make work and to feel empowered and to feel safe in doing so um, and as a result of that first convening i was invited onto the network track to continue um, doing that work and to discuss those ideas um, in a community of other indigenous artists and it was through that meeting regularly that we came to those um, specific areas of focus around kinship, around platforms and data, around food justice. And I, I also really appreciated how uh, deeply organic that process was and how um, it's, it's really beautiful to um, gather together as indigenous artists and as indigenous just people to come together and be like, this is really what we need. And this is how we need to feel supported in this field and in this work, um, not just merely being um, tokenized to fulfill like a DEI initiative or to, to fulfill a DEI statistic. It's like, we're actually coming together to actually say specifically like what it is that we, what are some very tangible things that we, um, what resources do we need to access? Um, what kind of platforms, what kind of, what modes of engagement, um, how, how do we feel, how do we feel um, 
safe and feel supported to be able to access these institutions and work with them um, that are deeply rooted in um, and rely upon um, modalities and frameworks of colonization, of extraction. And <clears throat> how do we not how do we not become how do we not experience the same kind of extractive violence that the arts field in general relies upon to <clears throat> sustain itself? And it I think it was an incredibly it was beautiful just to come together and to collaborate in this way and to talk about it. And through those discussions to arrive um, <clears throat> at the to arrive at like <clears throat> what are like the tangible next steps and for us to continue doing this work. And I think I think one of the very beautiful ways that that manifested was through um, the FNPA night at TBA, uh, PICA's TBA festival just this past year. Um, I was an artist in that and um, I was able to present my work along with five, six, seven other Indigenous artists for a night. And if, I think that night really, it speaks to a lot of my own um, interest in and um, deep commitment to like interdisciplinarity and to um, really sh show that like Indigenous artists and creators and you know, we're not just all making one kind of art or experience or and we're not we're not only engaging in our indigeneity in one very specific way. It's this beautiful multiplicity of ways that I think is deeply empowering and very um, I think it's just very beautiful. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And if you don't mind, Kevin, I'll actually just say because I think it's worth. Um, adding that the way that that event at uh, PICA's TBA festival that was in conjunction with FINIPA's 2022 convening, the way that that evening of performance was curated was basically a call out to the network track to say, hello, wonderful artists who would like to make an offering. And we created a, you know, a system of support that would, um, you know, that would be flexible to be able to support whoever said yes. And we worked with everyone and it was a it was a wild ride <laughs> of very different disciplines and and some that were in close uh kind of in close contact but still felt kind of worlds apart being next to each other um and kevin's offering that came late into the night was um very beautiful and had a lot of emotion and a lot of love um with a lot of folks in the room it just it felt very tactile um so i just wanted to, to offer that as well that um uh it was beautiful that the the same group of artists that were really shaping the direction of where FINIPA should go and having these conversations about what we should do for this many months all then came together to share artistic work in this moment in September. So sorry, Kevin, back to you. I just wanted to give that additional frame. No, I, I, I was actually, I think it was just about to wrap up what I was um, talking about and mentioning about that um, that night and, and the convening we had last year. Yeah. Um, it was a very deeply, uh, very deeply beautiful experience and it was um it's just, it's really great to share my work in a very intentional um indigenous context um that i don't think the that i don't think a lot of my work actually um gets shared with or is understood through um, a lens of being Diné Navajo. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was really incredible to participate in that. Amazing. Yeah, and I, I think the, um, the last thing I'll say in closing, uh, because then I want to pass it over to you, Emily, uh, is just that uh, coming out of that amazing period of months of uh, shaping by the network track, uh, we're going to be activating a series of working groups that are going to move um, that uh, sense of what we should be doing and with what lens into um, into, a, into an action, into a tangible thing. Uh, so we'll be um, 
organizing working groups around creation of these kinship protocol documents. Um, we have a working group called uh, Indian HR, which we're very excited about. Um, a group uh, to support data and platforms work, one for food justice, and then also one that has to do with uh, writing, uh, critical writing and archiving um, materials about indigenous performances because um, it's probably not a surprise to say that it's been challenging. Um, it, it, Kevin just spoke to indigenous con context and how that context is so critical and often, um, you know, th that context is not present, uh, you know, um, wherever performances are being offered and written about. Um, so it's been a very rich uh, couple of years for the network track. Um, and thank you to Kevin for holding the space with me and over to you, Emily. Awesome. I got like butterflies just thinking about the network track and all of those conversations and the future work coming and that performance at all in. And it was, it's, yeah, just love everybody in the network track and the network tracks coming too. Um, yeah, very grateful for everyone's input and work and heart there. Um, I'm going to share just a, a few more ways of. Um, that specifically that Catalyst, my company works, um, a few more ways that we work uh, to ensure, um, uh, yeah, to ensure our sovereignty um, as we're working um, and often working in partnership with settlers and institutions um, and different ways of how we do that. So first, I'm just gonna share briefly our decolonization writer. Um, so this is a writer um, and we engage this writer uh, before every, presentation, whether it's a speaking engagement or a commission or a presentation of work. Um, we're just scrolling through it now, but you can find it on our website, catalystdance.com, under the projects. Um, uh, we um, engage this in a conversational way with the partner that we're working with. Um, these, and that conversation, the way I the reason I say it like that is that this is, um, as has been said before, uh, this is not a checklist to go through, but these are items and um, focuses that that we as catalysts um, absolutely require our partners be working on and be in relation with. Um, and that is to ensure um, our safety, um, the safety of, of the, the artists who and collaborators who are working with me um, and it's also to try to ensure that um, institutions are activating and doing that structural change work in good ways that might open more doors um, and this the writer really came because i started to find it very necessary um, because the work that i do is very interwoven with uh, decolonial action with um, anti-colonial values um uh, i i needed to i understood that i needed to be very um upfront about that uh, in my in my process of working with presenters and um some of the things um uh for example the disclosures here um the focus on disclosures here um the, partly i find that sometimes institutions particularly universities don't know about don't know um what is in their stacks don't know that they might be holding ancestors or uh, cultural belongings that um, as I as a as who I am need to know about if I'm if I'm coming onto those premises um, at the very least I need to know about so I can make a decision of whether that's a, a safe a good uh, comfortable space for me to engage in working with um, and then likewise for the people that I that I bring along with me so I'm thinking about how our work is held, but also how the people whose bodies hold the work that I make is also held. So our, um, we are um, anti-colonial and abolitionists in all of our work, uh, policing, for example, and security, um, uh, you know, having police or security on site during our presentations, often which are outdoors or sometimes are outdoors, uh, puts actually the the BIPOC artists that I work with at risk. And so we have to have very frank conversations with presenters about, all right, how do, how, uh, how do we meet whatever you need to meet regarding what you are determining around safety, um, but how do we ensure uh, the safety and the abolitionist values um, that we're bringing as well. Um, and this is, uh, as, as uh, Vanessa and Felicia have been talking about with the um, Land Acknowledgement Survey, the, um, 
decolonization rider is always in process. Um, it's always growing, um, and it's uh, in deep relationship with um, with partners, with presenters, and it's never done. Um, so even present so. Um, presenting partners who sign on to the decolonization rider. It's almost like, it's like a promise to continue this work and to be engaged in this work. And that's why now we also have the decol assessment so that we can, we, can, um, we can continue to assess how those processes are going. One really exciting thing um, that we, that has really been wonderful to assess and that um, Kevin has mentioned is the ways that people are finding, the ways that our partners, presenting partners are finding to, um, resource funds back to uh, land back efforts or back to the local um, sovereign nations upon whose land they are occupying. So doing that through percentages of ticket sales, uh, we require that a 10% of whatever we're being paid, an additional 10% of that go to um, local nations or land back efforts. But there are multiple ways that, um, that land back and that resource um, shifting can happen. Um, and so that is an, an ongoing and really exciting thing to be um, to see and to be in partnership with organizations around. Um, and I also just want to really encourage artists to utilize this. Uh, any artist can find this on our website uh, and use it. Just swap out your name or your company <laughs> where <laughs> Emily Johnson Catalyst is. Um, cite us, of course, that'd be cool. Um, but use this and and um, and. And, and also um, share feedback with us on how your experience is with that. And I also, I think, need to particularly point out that it would, that um, uh, that white artists can use this, should use this. Our allies need to become our accomplices. Um, if all artists started using this, then um, all presenting organizations would need to um, make these structural changes. So just really encourage that, um, that use. And if you have any questions, reach out to me or Kevin about that for sure. Um, um, uh, I'm going to share also just a little bit um, about, uh, so decolonization rider is, is, is a structural way that we work with presenters and presenting organizations. And then the way that I structure Catalyst um, is with these different branches and different groups of people working in different areas of focus. And so one of those areas is um, the branch of action. Um, so we make performances, but really we're reworlding. So <laughs> part of that <laughs> reworlding, we have to support. We have to support with action and with ongoing action. So that's the branch of action. Its full poetic name is branch of action, speculative architecture of the overflow. Uh, so the overflow for short. So we're we're supporting from a performance what actions, what overflow actions might be supported, might we support that could support local land back, local rematriative, cultural local um, culturally rematriative processes. And so that goes in every place that we tour to and every place that we work. And so, and that's, that's a lot of places and people to be in relation with. And Ivy Castellanos is the interconnector. That is their, that's their role with Catalyst in relation to working with the overflow. So they tend to relationships and they reach out to folks who are leading the, um, the land back and the land rematriative efforts in the places that we go and we build those relationships over time and then we find ways via our presence there that we can support um, by by listening to to what is being asked um, and then we try to support um, we try to support those actions in an ongoing way after so we're not just picking up and leaving but we're building our kinship network um, as we go um, and that has been really um, uh, gorgeous and ongoing process and really as as a land defender um, I really <laughs> see and feel how it's very purposeful how our actions um, are siloed right and and are um, are um, by media by society certainly by government kind of seen as or pointed to as separate like that that land protection effort in Atlanta is different than the land protection effort in Lenape Hill King. That land, you know, when in reality all of our land protection efforts are deeply interconnected and deeply interwoven. And I think that this action of the overflow and just paying attention to the overflow um, helps to kindle, helps to kindle some connections. Um, and then finally, I'll just speak very briefly about the branch of knowledge. So this is another of our branches. Um, so we're based in Lenape Hoking, 
and I am from the Yupik Nation, which is quite far geographically <laughs> from Lenape Hoking. <laughs> and, um, and I know that I need to be in relation with um, uh, Lenape folks and every geography uh, um, uh, is, is going to be different where you are. The, the, uh, the history of colonization in every um, geography of what we'll just limit it right now to what is called the U.S. is is very different. It's a very different process, very different history. Though there are obviously through lines, um, and here in the Napa Hill King, the Napa people have been forcibly removed uh, from their homeland, and so uh, so with the branch of knowledge as a very specific um, uh, way to try to build relationships um, with with Lenape folks. Um, we work with River Whittle, who's of the Caddo Nation and Delaware Nation of Oklahoma. And they are, um, you could say they're like a community liaison. Um, so they reached out to folks from the uh, six uh, sovereign Lenape nations that are now based in Oklahoma and Wisconsin and Canada because of forced removals, um, and gathered folks from those nations who wanted to be involved in a creative conversation. We were very clear: this is not about policy. This is not like a, this is not a, um, a um, cons consultation group, anything like that. This is a group of folks who want to be involved in a creative conversation with an artist who's based in their homelands, and and who wants to try to build those relationships. And we started to meet every two weeks. It's like a group of 12 matriarchs and um, meet, meeting on Zoom. And it became very clear um, in the very first part of our meetings that folks wanted to come home, wanted to come and visit their homelands. And so Catalyst put it to their charge to, uh, to, to, for, to resource that trip and to, um, to work with uh, partners and organizations to resource that trip and to um, make that pathway home a reality and to build on that, build on that trip and build on um, folks' presence together in their homeland. I can't reiterate how much, <laughs> how deeply important um, that is that, that we, you know, that, that we have access to our lands. And so to be able to provide a trip um, for folks to come home, some folks coming for their first time, others have been here many times. Um, and these matriarchs um, all brought kids and some brought grandkids. And so there was a big joyful group that was here um, for a little bit less than a week on this first trip, um, building their power by being here and being on their homelands. Uh, we had strategic meetings with um, some organizations who are continuing to support that group in their return home. Um, the, the group, um, you know, built an agenda to visit uh, spaces, sacred spaces here that they needed to. Uh, we had feasts, we had food. Um, it was in conjunction with the show being Future Being. And so we got to be on stage together and talk. And um, yeah, this is just one of the ways that we are, that um, Catalyst is, is working with uh, River and the Branch of Knowledge to support uh, this, this homecoming and this ongoing homecoming. And really that group is building its own sovereignty and power now and autonomy. And um, I'm just super excited to see where that goes. And when people are home and on their lands, that's that's what the world needs, you know, it needs indigenous folks uh, caring, caring for the lands and being on the lands. Yeah. Emily, that was so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Ooh, I um, I, I think I'm also just so moved at the the commitment uh, of Catalyst to um you know just as uh just as catalyst is asking for anyone on manahata and then up hoking to think about right relations i mean that that commitment and that homecoming it's um it's certainly something that i'm i'm thinking about a lot with um folks from um Wapmadog and nipmuc nations um where i'm now residing it's uh and I think you just really underscored what joyful work it can be to make those, um, you know, to, to have those homecomings. So I, I think that this is now moving us towards our, uh, our all in moment of closing. So um, this is really a chance to share a reflection or um, something in the conversation that sparked for you. Uh, just spending a couple minutes in closing with all of us together. 
And if you have a prompt, uh, Emily, please, by all means, but um, anyone can also jump in with a thought. I have a very practical question. Mm -hmm. Do you know when you're going to do the next track um, of the decolonization work? I'm sure many people watching this want to know the answer to that question. Ronnie and I have a meeting on Tuesday. <laughs> that's, that's not a lie. Hopefully we'll figure it out. on the agenda. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. We do, want, we do want. Yeah. Yeah, but certainly <laughs> with this, um, we'll, uh, be, we'll be sure to have our, our, the email very well available that anyone who's interested, please um, drop a line because it's uh, – it's, it's definitely something that we're continuing. And with that, if there are um, indigenous artists in your community that you think would be interested in being in relationship with Finipa in any way, please connect, connect us um, because we are really in the space of, um, uh, you know, even with the working groups, with our consortium, with uh, network track, you know, we, we want to be increasing the folks that are in our, um, in our circles and that, um, that takes everybody. But thanks, Bill. And thanks for the vote of confidence. <laughs> I just want to pick up on the joy that you were talking about, Ronnie. Like, yeah, um, you know, the, 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 the joy that this work um, can be um, and, and can, can generate too. And I really heard it whenever it, you know, during everyone's sharing as well. And so I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll just, um, say on the joy part too that um in, in some other circles i've and there have been a lot of conversations about the ways in which colonialism uh it, it's it's similar to the way that we talk about i think um the toxicity around uh uh certain gender dynamics right that um uh, oh gosh um the gender dynamics we have now affect everyone not just women not just uh non you know, heterosexual men. It's it negatively affects everyone, and colonialism is much the same. Uh, it's an extractive process that just is, um, in all the ways you can think about, is is uh, harmful, and that has been so much our legacy and our present. To your earlier point, Bill, and you know, it's it's one of those things that once you see the matrix, you can't unsee it, <laughs> as I like to say, in terms of seeing colonialism everywhere. So it's this work you know it feels so much to me it's uh very obviously in service to indigenous people and i think you know it would be i think it's always important to underscore too that this is about uh, always about creating a better world for all of us to live in um and we all want that so this is the 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 lens that we're putting that we're putting onto it you know better world for indigenous people better world for black folks better world for the most marginalized um, that's what we're all going for. Yeah. Any other thoughts or reflections before we go to a close to your team? Um, I just want to, uh, highlight something that Emily said a, a few moments back about how, um, and to Ronnie, your point that colonialism likes to uh, put us in a silo and, and have us think and focus only on the work that we're doing in our locality. And, and it's a myth to think that um, there aren't people in other places um, across time that have been doing this work and that will continue to do this work. And so there, there is also so much joy in, in that solidarity and knowing that this work is is ongoing um and that it will continue and that that we we are not alone as we work um towards these goals i think you just did it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you everyone yeah okay well um i'll just start the uh uh, the closing by just sending a big thanks to everyone who's joined this space and for your time and your attention and care and presence and vulnerability and labor. Um, it, it's just been a privilege to be on this call with you and I extend that uh, to you as well, Emily. Thank you for being such a um, incredible partner and um, 
Oh, I'm going to start getting teary. Um, this is this this uh, whole plenary has been such a reminder of uh, the past few years of years of work, um, and uh, I'm very I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for everyone in the space. Um, and Emily, I want to also give you space to offer some thanks as well. Thanks again, Kiana, and thank you all. Yeah, for for now and for future work. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, what do everyone? Take care. Ooh, goodness. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Emily, Ronnie, Kevin, Bill, Adele, Asia, Vanessa, Felicia. That was an incredible way to start this conference and I'm um, so grateful. Um, I just have about 30 seconds of housekeeping things to mention. Um, and I wanna say how much I appreciate the, um, the pacing of this session that we just had, um, the deliberate way in which you have all spoken and left kind of space for us to really consider the complexity and the depth of what you've been sharing with us. Thank you for that. Um, there were a lot of great comments and questions in the chat, and we would love to keep these conversations going, um, not just today, um, but throughout the, the conference over these next few days together. Um, so you can click on the event forum tab um, in the platform. You can do it while the live streaming is happening. So don't worry that you're gonna lose your place and have to go back. I tried it, <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, and then you can click on the session name on the left-hand side and you can add reflections. Um, a lot of the links that were shared today are in there. Those will be evergreen throughout the conference. So um, you can um, uh, stay connected to these conversations, use that as a kind of bulletin board. Um, and it's really intended as a way to invite all of you into the conversation at your own pace. So you can add things while the session's happening. You can add things at two in the morning as they come to you. You can think about it for a few days and reflect back. Um, we would love to join the conversation with you um, in that way as well. That is it for this plenary session. Um, so grateful to be with you here and to launch this conference. Um, really appreciate everybody joining us and hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day with the breakout sessions to come. Thanks, y'all.